I am Linda von Tolberg for Biz News. Rise from Zanzi is one of the new political parties that emerged in the past year in South Africa under the leadership of Songhezo Zibi. It's now about a year old, and we've spoken exactly almost a year ago with Songhezo. Um, to, and now we want to hear what he hopes to achieve in the May elections and what policies the party plans to pursue. So, Songhezo Zibi, thanks so much for joining us. Linda, thank you very much for having me on. Well, it's been a year, as I said, since we spoke to you. Before we get into the policies that businessmen want to hear about, what kind of progress have you made in the past year? You know, we in fact, I was talking to a friend yesterday, and then he was remarking that he can't believe that it's been a whole year. At the same time, he can't believe that it's only been a year, given how much we've been able to do over the last uh, 12 months. It's going to be 12 months on the 19th of April. And we've grown beyond our own expectations. Uh, we do what we call signing up um, a registered supporters. In other words, somebody who's registered, who's listened to our message and has decided that they're going to vote for us in the next election. That becomes your base of voters because we're a new political organization. Other parties already have members. And by the time we get to the election, we'll have about 500,000 of those people, which equates to about 12 12 for short seats uh, in the National Assembly. And we believe that we, we're good for, for 20 seats if we don't make any any major mistakes in our campaign. So you're trying to win voters, and obviously it's the business community, and there's been quite substantial support from the business community. I think reported you are reported to have attracted the highest funding uh, you know, from the business community among political parties. How vital is the support of this sector for your party? So, by the way, we've received support from, uh, from, from various people, including high net worth individuals. But actually, the business community generally does not give to political parties. It's generally high net worth individuals. There was a quarter in which our declaration was the highest of the new political parties, but the biggest receivers of funding by far are the ANC and the Democratic Alliance by multiples, uh, by the way. But the support we've received has enabled us to make the progress that we have, and we are very grateful for it. Well, the, the, I think the policy that attracted the most attention is um, your view on land expro expropriation and particularly within it the business is. community. So can you elaborate on the policy and say whether it will include provisions for compensation? Yes. So, you know, when we launched Rise and Zanz, we released a document. It's very detailed. It's still on our website. It's called the Our Politics document, if somebody goes on our website. What the, one of the first uh, principles of Rise and Science's very foundations is the Constitution. It's Chapter 2 of the Constitution. Chapter 2 of our Constitution is the Bill of Rights. Entrenched in the Bill of Rights are property rights. Our Constitution, however, also allows for expropriation of land for a public purpose. And I've made this example many times. I used to work in the mining industry. When minerals are discovered under a mine, that mine is either sold by the farmer to the mining company or in instances where it is necessary, it is expropriated. We do so with dams. We do so with the how train that we've got in South Africa. And my point was and is that it is not necessary to amend the constitution as the ANC and the EFF have proposed years ago. The only reason we have not had meaningful land justice is because they simply have not taken it seriously. Over the, over the years. It is time to use our same constitution to expropriate land when necessary. And that comes with appropriate compensation without a doubt because it is inherent in this same constitution that we have. So I, I have been actively misrepresented in what I actually believe is deliberate disinformation uh, because I, I believe John can read and, uh, and he can read English. It's his first language. So I, I really have no doubt that they fully understand what we've said. And I don't think anyone in the business community or as an individual should want it. My own family knows the experience of being arbitrarily deprived of land by a state that is acting unconstitutional. It is wild to suggest that I would advocate for the same. Yeah, so I, I think the allegations was a land grab. So definitely not a land grab. 
No, definitely not a land grab. We, we've got a plan. So at Rise and Zan, see, we, we treat various issues as interconnected. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, is that we, we believe that we should do spatial planning first. You take account of the historical need for land. You take account of population growth. You take account of urbanization. You make a determination about what land you are going to need where and for what purpose. And therefore, you make a determination on where land may need to be expropriated because you now have a purpose for expropriating that land. We've made this clear many times. The reason we have informal settlements and this illegal allocation of land in rural areas and so on is because there's no spatial planning. And if you don't do spatial planning, you can't say why you want to expropriate land where you need to expropriate land. So... Uh, this plan is really logical, and anybody uh, who's reading it honestly will see no problem with it. And the other policy I think that businessmen want to know about is how do you feel about BEE? I think people should uh, differentiate between cronism, as the ANC has uh, practiced it, because they have run possibly the longest lasting and the biggest racketeering scam that this country has ever seen through what they have called BE. Now, it is important that we have frank discussions in South Africa. It is imperative that black people, that women of all races and other marginalized groups have a meaningful stake in South Africa's economic productivity and ownership of economic assets and jobs and so on. It is absolutely crucial. You can't reverse a policy of racial discrimination without accounting for racial metrics in what you are measuring, right? Because if you don't ask those questions, you also have the fear of populism that people are so afraid. So you can't deny something and want to address it at the same time. But that said, our point is the people that we must seek to empower most urgently are those who are not even able to set a foot in the door. What do we mean by that? It's the 48% of kids who never finish school. It is the rest of the kids who finish matric but get no further training. You can't be economically empowered if you can't finish school. If after you leave school, you get no training and therefore you cannot get the job. For most people, over 90% of people, their first entry into the economy is through a job. You gain experience and so on. And eventually you become an entrepreneur, you own a business and that kind of thing. And what we're suggesting as Rise and Sons, you place the immediate focus on where people are feeling the pain the most, and you escalate your, 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 your interventions according to where you, you want to be in the economy. There are other changes that can be made. For instance, we do not believe that government money should be used to enable one or two people who want to be billionaires to buy a small stake in another company. Unions have provident funds. They are HANA pension funds for them. They must enter into those kind of arrangements. Most of these are, are investments by black workers in any case. Let them get into those arrangements, get into the boardrooms of large companies for which their own members work, and help to influence the decisions of those companies. And as far as government funds are concerned, use that money for the marginalized so that they can get a foot in the door and one day become billionaires. Yeah, well, you just talked about, I think, the issue that a couple of people got rich, the entrepreneurs, and got richer and richer, and it hasn't filtered down to the, to the, pe the people at the bottom because that's why people poor, that's why people don't have jobs. So how do you ensure it does filter down to the people on the ground? Well, it, it filtered, you know, there, there, is a, there is a very successful philosopher. He was a minister as well, Roberto Mangabera Una. And he's got a simple philosophy. He's Brazilian, and he was part of Lula's first government, uh, the current Brazilian president. And he says, what you need to do is to democratize the markets. What does that mean? You enable a larger number of entrants that are more diversely owned, that are more creative in terms of the products they bring into the economy and so on, to enter the established markets so that you begin to change the shape of an economy. What does this mean? That means young entrepreneurs in technology, in services and other things, you need to see a potential in them eventually becoming an Adrian Gore 
or he lori dipe na or somebody like that, right? Or a Mark Shuttle. And that is why we place so much focus on the development of young entrepreneurs, people with uh, with talent, with work experience, with the ideas. That's what public funds should do, uh, which is what the Americans have done with what we now we understand to be Silicon Valley. These some of these developments, like such as the internet itself, for the U.S. Defense Department, but the development into the economy was significant. Yeah. Well, you mentioned John's name earlier, which is, of course, John Stianazen. There seems to be a bit of an argument between the two of you. Um, and because you expressed your intention to unseat the DA in the Western Cape, prompting criticism from John. So why target the opposition party instead of the ANC? There are two governing parties in South Africa. One is the African National Congress. The other one is the Democratic Alliance. It is silly and entitled for any of the two parties to say for any reason that where they are the incumbent, there should be no competition. I remember Njimot Sekhaf some years ago said that opposition parties are unnecessary. Why do we need opposition parties? They impede uh, the work of government that it's doing. They just oppose everything. I don't know if you remember that. John is saying the same thing, <laughs> Right. The, the reality is that in a democracy, it's not personal, in a democracy, there are sins that come with incumbents. And that is certain sections of the population are going to be unhappy with you because they feel that your services are too slow, they're not good enough, you don't care about them, and so on. It is stunning for John or anyone to say, well, tough. Those people must not be represented. <laughs> Otherwise, in the next local government elections, we shouldn't, well, there should be no opposition. Everybody who's an incumbent should remain an incumbent because it's unfair. Like, you shouldn't be a cry baby. And this is not personal. <laughs> uh, um, so would you be prepared to sit in a coalition with the DA at some stage and tell John it's like a, ru a rugby match? Yeah, we had, you know, we scrolled yes. and it was rough. And yeah. We have said that so many times. We have said this idea that in an open democracy such as ours, everybody needs to agree with you and not compete with you before the election. It's silly. Nobody does. We've got several countries that we can use as an example that have had coalition governments for years. Let's take Belgium and Germany, which I know very well. Each of the parties go and box it out within the rules in the election and they fight to maximize their, 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 <laughs> their, their percentage of the electorate. Then after that, they take off their T-shirts and they put on their suits and ties and they sit in a room and they say, okay, guys, bring me your top five. I'll bring my top five. And we'll talk about how we can address your top four maybe. And if we do that, we address 80% of the needs of the electorate. And you do that in the interest of the country. So what if the ANC comes to you and said, we need a smaller party? Well, they are, they are, by the way, there are conditions to all of these political parties. Some are more likely than others to accept these rules. So, for instance, the current president of the ANC, Cyril Ramaphosa, is mired in the Panapana scandal. They, there can be no excuses. That has to be investigated properly, impartially. And if he needs to be prosecuted, he must. Paul Mashatile has got problems of his own. A, and Gwede Mantashe has got problems of his own. Let me just put it this way. We will not enter into a coalition with anyone where the quid pro quo is that some of our senior officials must be exempt, otherwise the coalition is going to collapse. I think the facts tell us that the ANC may fall into that category, into that category. And therefore it might be really difficult to go into an arrangement with the ANC. But having said that, it is important for, for viewers and listeners of this show to understand that none of us know how the election is going to turn out. It is easy to make all of these assertions and so on. What really is important is principles, right? To say, this is what we'll put on the table. And I've just outlined it. A, the others is agreement on certain key portfolios. We have to have, have the right finance minister. We have to have uh, the right minister of justice, the right minister of police. I mean, like you can't have tainted people in these roles and that sort of thing. They have to be highly capable and, and credible. That's how you're going to recover South Africa. And if we are comfortable that those conditions can be met by a lot of the parties involved, then we are in. Otherwise, we are happy to be in parliament and do the work of oversight and not be in a government. 
What is your position on foreign policy, uh, specifically at the moment, the Iran, uh, the, the Israel-Gaza problem? So I think generally, uh, so that people understand the context to this, we believe there are three main drivers of foreign policy for South Africa. The first is to advance our economic interest. Uh, this is not in order of importance. It's just the top three. Uh, the second is to advance a culture of human rights across the world. The third is to build cultural, business, and other relationships between the South African people and the peoples of those countries, which means we build relationships that transcend the government that is in power. And the people can continue to relate on that basis. So that's, that's very important. We see the situation between Israel and Palestine as a human rights issue. One. Secondly, it is an international law issue. What does that mean? That means we care first and foremost about the lives and well-being of human beings, whether they're Israeli or Palestinian. And anywhere those human beings are brought into harm's way, especially in an unjustifiable manner, then we would condemn it. What does this mean in practice? It means that the attack by Hamas on the 7th of October is clearly a violation of human rights. You don't go and attack civilians in that way, and it is okay in any definition of war in terms of international law. Similarly, though, you also do not want to see dead, blooded babies being pulled out of rubble in Gaza, right? You do not want to see that. What is tragic about this is that everybody wants to be a saint, it's either or. It is not possible for some people to condemn both because in terms of human rights law, they are, they are not acceptable. The second thing is, you know, we've been criticized about uh, saying that uh, the International Court of Justice was the right forum. Of course, we believe in international law. If anyone has an accusation against any country, they need to approach the appropriate forum, make their case, Quit with the insults and so on. Prepare your case, take it to the right forum, argue your case rationally in front of the world's eyes and let that forum decide. There is nothing wrong with that. Ukraine did with Russia. Just last year, or year before, and the ICJ ruled against Russia. This is the kind of thing you want to advance uh, international law. But in this orgy of self-righteousness that we've seen from people, if you say something that people don't like, you are a bad guy. And I think we need to reflect, especially as people who like to invoke the life and legacy of Nelson Mandela, eh, that we really need to reflect on our ability to listen to and, and see and hear one another and try and do the right thing. And um, finally, can you, what other policies do you feel passionate about? You know, there is one thing that business people will understand. Uh, because this is a platform in which we are. What do investors buy into? Investors buy into three things. They buy into your strategy. They look at your leadership to see if it can implement that strategy. So is a strategy good enough? Is a leadership good enough to implement that strategy? And will that strategy give me the capital growth and cash flows that I'm looking for? Three things. It's no different with politics. The number one thing that we've put on our manifesto is leadership and governance, right? Many of South Africa's economic problems arise out of poor governance, arise out of corruption, right? You look at ESCO. I don't have to go into detail. We haven't had a chief executive and FD for a long time until recently, right? You look at Transnet, similarly, and there's three percentage points GDP growth locked up between them according to the Reserve Bank. So, if we didn't have those uh, bottlenecks, we'd be at 4% GDP growth, which is astronomical in terms of what we've achieved over the last little while. The other one is what is crime, right? We've had a crime problem. Fifth is infrastructure. And what are we intend to invest in infrastructure? And finally, is how that leadership is able to address the looming debt crisis that we have and fiscal crisis that we potentially have in the future. And so we, we set out to address those issues because we believe that Anything else almost doesn't matter, frankly, Linda. <laughs> you know, we can we can talk at nauseam about smart ideas we have about digitizing driver's licenses and car licenses and this kind of thing. If you don't have the people, 
So uh, just finally, um, if you are President Zongezo Zebi in a coalition or whatever, whose footsteps would you like to walk in? Whew, there are so many. I mean, you mean in politics? Yeah, maybe a Nelson Mandela. Who? No, I mean, there, there are multiple candidates, and I would like really, I mean, if that were to happen, and even though I don't think, I think it's a very long shot, uh, that there, there really are, are two leaders for me that, that stand out for different reasons. One is uh, Barack Obama. He took over the U.S. It's not because of the speech. <laughs> he took over the U.S. in 2009. It was in the depths of an economic and social crisis, because of the global financial crisis. By the time he left office, it was a net producer of jobs. Economic growth was up. And, 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 and he left office with southern taint of scandal. The second is Madiba, because of his ability to, to unify and stick to principle and do the right thing, while speaking honestly about, about many things. You know, the thing about Madiba is people choose whatever version of him they that suits their purpose at a particular time. But Madiba could be remarkably frank, brutal and so, but he was doing it with love. He was doing it with love. He didn't do it out of malice or hate. And, and, and uh, t- that, I think that's a good attribute in a leader. Well, Zungeza Zibis, thanks so much for talking to us and good luck with yeah, the campaign. Thank you so much and thanks for having me on. <laughs>